Hi everybody, how are we doing today? Welcome to Sketchbook Sunday. I need to make some sound adjustments here. And make sure our music is not too loud, it sounds okay. How's everybody doing this morning? Hope you're all well. It is absolutely freezing outside again. I think I have a decent fire. Oh no, the fire's getting low. Probably gonna have to get up and put some wood on that soon. Just want to uh, introduce the book, *The Secret Lives of Color*, um, and I love this book because of the way it's organized and what it tells you. So, first of all, the nice thing about this is it's organized by color, right? So you can go through here and find a hue that you're interested in, just kind of learning about, and then open to any page. And it's going to go through a whole bunch of really interesting stories about that color. So uh, author, please, is Cassia St. Clair. Cassia is spelled K-A-S-S-I-A. -S -S Kaja. It's Penguin Press. Fantastic book. Now, since we have a little bit of Naples yellow on the palette today, later today, actually, although there's a few other yellows in here that might more appropriate but just to give you a taste of this I'm gonna read you like the first paragraph from this book from on, on Naples yellow okay so Naples yellow and uh, listen to this sometime in the early 1970s a collection of 90 small bottles was discovered in an old German pharmacy near Darmstadt some were as round and plain as jam jars others looked like ink wells and some resembled tiny stoppered perfume bottles each had its own carefully written calligraphy label but even so it was hard but even so it was hard to identify what each contained the powders liquids and resins were labeled with words as unfamiliar and outlandish as virid eris cudbeard persia and gumiguta when examined in a laboratory in amsterdam it was discovered that this was in fact a cache of pigments from the 19th century one bearing the cramped legend Bear with me on this one. Napelgeld Neopolinisch Gelb Verde Verbedong des Spiedglage Blies was Naples yellow. It says the pigment's owner did not yet know it, but at the time that it had been stashed, Naples yellow's days as an essential part of the artist's palette were numbered. The name properly applies to a synthetic preparation of lead antimonate, which is usually pale yellow with just a suggestion of warm red undertones. This book goes on and on. Two full pages just about the color Naples yellow. Absolutely fantastic read here. Um, and then when you're preparing your own palette and uh, enjoying your own paints, you got a little bit of backstory to go with it. So the secret lives of color, pick it up. Today, today we are going to draw the Hercules beetle. <laughs> the Hercules beetle, he's a beast. Let's take a look at the Hercules beetle real quick. Now, the Hercules beetle is common in Central and South America. He is the largest of the various uh, horned beetles. And that male right there can get to be seven inches in length. They are the largest flying insects on the planet. Um, and somewhere, somewhere, <laughs> Mom's like, you just made my day, yeah, good. Good, let me see if I can pull up a scale example. I don't know if this is gonna work. Let's see if this works. Um, let me see if I can capture this window. Hang on a second. I wanna show you what this one looks like being held by a person. Imagine holding that in your hand. I mean, that is just, you want one, so amazing. Yeah, you know my, something I learned from that book, carrots were engineered to be orange they were originally only purple, yellow, and white. You know, that's funny because I tried to grow the purple, yellow, and white varieties because I thought they were, they just seemed more, you know, like potatoes, like root vegetables. They seemed like they were, they really belonged on, that orange always seemed unnatural to me. That's kind of cool. I, did you get that? I think you got that from that book. I didn't know that. Uh, my mind was blown. Yeah. I mean, this book has so many nuggets in there like that. You know, it's so revealing and enlightening. And the beauty of it is, is you can just pick it up and read two pages, right? And then put it down. You, you know, you're, you're in bed, but it's 
time for bed, grab the book, read about a color, go to sleep. I love that about it. So anyway, here is the Hercules beetle. He is absolutely monstrous. I love him. And we are going to draw one today. Now you can see why I picked yellow ochre. Look at that shell on the back. Or the carapace. Is it the carapace? No, it's not the carapace. It is the um, elytra. The elytra is the hard shell that covers up the wings that live underneath. You need bigger paper. You can draw him small. You can draw him small. I have a giant image here on my screen, actually, of him. Um, and it's kind of hard to see on the image I'm showing you, but it's got all this watermark copyright stuff over it because I pulled it off the internet. Now, one thing that's really, really cool about this beetle, and this is probably a, a function of evolution on some level, is if you look, you can see the three legs on the side facing us back to attach to the main part of the body but the front two physically attach underneath what i assume to be the mandible the the jaw right they're like under here because the thing is so massive it clearly needs to have its own level of transportation which i think is just just brilliant just brilliant so we're going to draw this guy today All right, or you so can draw whatever you want how do we go about starting something like this first of all one subject that I like to talk about a lot in drawing when we're learning how to draw is the subject of shape. Now this sounds really simplistic. It's like shape, squares, triangles, circles, but also organic shapes and breaking things down into basic shapes. And this is a perfect, this, this, this beetle is a perfect example of that in that, you know, you've got that area where the elytra cover the body, right? It's sort of like an almond slice. It's got a bit of a wrapped contour to it as it runs around the back. But if you just look at it as a, to start, as a flat shape, just think of it in those terms. You can think about its relationship to the, the, the horn, the piece that comes off the front of the head, and how that long, funneled, curved, cornucopia-type shape, you know, comes off the front of that head. You can also think about the way in which that horn attaches to that body, and how there's a squareness to it on the top, but then it rolls forward underneath so shape is important and sometimes distilling an image the thing you're going to draw uh, down to its basic shapes is a great place to start it's something really interesting to think about another shape you can think about in this is the shape of the negative space so look at the shape of the space between the two mandibles that are open right that football shaped space that houses that beautiful little orchid in the background that in itself is a shape to consider and can help you in drawing this, right? Maybe you can't quite get that upper, that lower curve to the mandible right because you're trying to draw the mandible. But what if you tried to draw the negative space in there, right? Now all of a sudden you've got a different region of the image to sort of think about and work with. So um, let's see, I don't want that pencil. I kind of want this. So we're gonna do some color today. We're gonna to mix up some chromatic blacks. We're gonna work with that yellow ochre back there. Um, I really like the contrast of the way that black piping runs around that ochre elytra on the back. And so, you know, you know me, I like to work gesturally to start, right? And so I'm just gonna kind of work around this idea of that carapace shape. And you also know that when I draw, I tend to work and rework, right? And we can also think about proportion. Like this mandible, this horn on the front of this thing is massive compared to the rest of the body. And if I use my pencil to kind of get a feel for it, that mandible is two times the size of the body. Right, so don't be afraid to draw that really large. And if I do that here, if I take a measurement here, this to that to that, I'm almost right on the money with this piece, this horn piece being two times the size, right? And so again, we're just kind of feeling it out here. This drops in, it rolls around, and then comes up the back. And this is really
But anyway, I love these little segmentations in the leg and how they kind of, how they control, how, how the insect's brain is able to control them in a way that's just, you know, it would be like having 12 knees and being able to control all 12 of your knees. I think that's another reason why I'm drawn to this is just this form. It's such a beautiful form. I feel like without some kind of tree reference here, I've got to figure out how to deal with my drop shadow in a sort of artificial kind of way. So I might just start messing with that a little bit by trying to lay that in. Drop shadows have different levels of intensity. They're gonna grow darker the closer they physically get to the object that they are being thrown by. You also have to try and think about the shape of the object above it that is throwing that shadow down, right? So the, the width of this head is considerable. So I'm trying to bring that shadow out in both directions here. And I'm not getting too crazy with how dark it is just yet, however, over here, right where this jaw lays on the ground, I might get a little bit darker, right? Now don't worry, later when I come in and I start to clean this up and I create a delineation between the mandible and the ground, that'll have a better presence. Is this shadow here is being caused by light hitting this. And if I don't also equally lighten that space that's being hit by the light source, the drop shadow will not have the same believability, right? So that's kind of get important. into a little bit of, uh, I could mix up a little bit of color for this, this section here. Why don't we do that? Stop talking about it and do xing up just a slightly darker than needed um, ochre here. And I'm gonna thin it way down with the water and just push it about see how we feel about this Keep in mind as you look at this horn on this beetle, he's got these sections, these striate, not striations, but he's got these ribbons of dark to light as the highlights touch him in different ways. And so rather than just generalize and fill in, I'm kind of rolling with the length. Now, if I look at my photo here, I can see that there is predominantly a dark line that runs around the top all the way around this top edge. And so as I sort of revisit with my color, every time I load my brush with this, what is currently purple and will live as a kind of underpainting, um, I'll first start by stroking on that line, right? I think having this much insect on your hand would be would make it would certainly make me incredibly uneasy you know there's something about holding a bunny which this is about the size of a baby bunny <laughs> you hold a bunny and it's soft and there's a comfort in that softness this has armor and you have something with armor in your hand and every once in a while you get pressed against by some of that armor and it's it's like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Even though it's probably not trying to hurt you at all, it has a kind of, um, it has a kind of, I don't know, sharpness. Not with the intention to hurt you, but it, you know, it just sort of throws your, your reaction off for a second. You're like, I don't like that. That's not a soft, fuzzy bunny, <laughs> right?
I'm not gonna do it with the with the gouache just because I don't feel like fighting that right now. I feel like I've got a little more control here over this pencil. So let's just darken it up. This is our Hercules Staghorn Beetle. Ben says, happy birthday, Terry's dad. I'm sure she will love that. I will let him know. Um, he is a very gentle soul and an awesome painter, by the way. We're going to put some of his paintings one night. Maybe even this week we'll show one of his paintings on the show just to say happy birthday to him. And you won't believe it. He's like... And once he got really good at it, and I'm talking about really good at it, he stopped. He's like, where am I going to put all these things? And I was like, I'll take them. Just keep making them. I'll take them all. So we have a lot of them stored. Um, but... You know, he doesn't paint so much anymore, which is a shame. I think we're going to call it quits right there. I think that is the end for me today. I have work. I have other work to do. I've got some things to accomplish. So, again, thanks to all of you for hanging out. I really appreciate you coming and spending this time with me. Hopefully you learned something today. Next week on Sketchbook Sunday, we will do more. We'll probably bounce back, do a bird, do a piece of wildlife or something. Um... And uh, we'll go from there. So you guys have yourself a great Sunday. Make some great art. Keep on drawing. And uh, we will catch up with all of you later on. Let's go to a larger image just so we can see him one more time. There he is in all his glory. I kind of like him. All right, people.